Hello everybody, Kevin Luther here and welcome to the Luxury and Lucid Wine Tasting Show. I'm here with uh, Jerome Luther, my brother. Hello everybody. And we're going to be uh, tasting you guys through a cool selection of wines, stuff we make here at Luxury and Lucid. And yeah, a really fun lineup today. More red heavy, uh, with just the one lighter wine, the rosé. So. Yeah, it'll be well, fun. Yeah, and Hello, the before is Kevin Luther here, well, and welcome to uh, the luxury and lucid wine yeah, tasting true. show. Yeah, true. So we do have one I'm kind of on the lighter side Luther, red, and then we go into so some medium and heavy reds. It's a nice uh, array of reds, through, uh, but no white. Cool selection of wines. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a cool lineup of wines. We're also going to be talking about food and wine pairings, and ways you want lighter wine in your food, as well as the suggestions we gave you guys for these wines, so you may have prepared your cheese and meat platter or your yeah, uh, you know, vegan so we do have one gourmet kind of platter of, of pairings yeah, based on our suggestions. Like or you may just be here to learn, learn a bit today. No Either way, we're going to kind of cover all. So, yeah, we don't have our, our lineup board of today. Wines. I guess it's one of those unspoken things. I don't know what you get there. So I did not prepare us up for it today. We will have it the next couple of weeks. So we'll still go put a heavy emphasis on your cheese and platters. or encourage you guys to share photos of platters as well. Based on our suggestions. So we have already seen some folks sent us photos or posted stuff with, with really cool uh, yeah, we cheese platters. Our, our Debra, I guess Debra, Debra Gonzalez. Yeah, Debra Gonzalez. We said your cheese platter. Look, we're jealous. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a brief intro to who we are and what we're doing here. Uh, you know, like I say, we are voluptuary and loose. I'm the owner and winemaker here, and Jerome handles shipping and internal logistics. So we have already seen some folks sent us photos or posted stuff with really cool Wizard of Oz style. And we do most of what's going on here. We have a small team of part-timers that are helping us. Uh, Zach is here today, you know, behind the scenes, checking the video and audio. And uh, intro to who we are and also, what we're doing here. Uh, comments, you know, please throw those into the comments section of the video, either on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching. And um, he'll let us know. We're also kind of monitoring, but he'll let us know if we don't spot it. If you make a good comment or ask a question, he'll shout that out, and we will answer your question on air. Uh, and that's our team. We're a super small team. We're a micro winery here in Sacramento, California, buying grapes from local vineyards, organically grown vineyards. All of the luxury stuff is certified organic and super, super small production, usually one or two barrels. And the lucid wines are organically grown, but not necessarily certified organic. Um, there's a little bit more vineyards that can do that, and therefore I can make a little more wine into that brand. Um, and it's, it tends to be a little more fruit forward, just uh, just general, you know, delicious wine. So two brands, one micro winery. We're a thousand square feet here in Sacramento. It's 20 feet wide, 50 feet deep, tiny little warehouse where we make all this wine. So we're so tiny. These kits and these tastings are just absolutely keeping our little micro winery alive. We, we wouldn't have been able to do this without you guys. So it just, it, you know, it means a lot. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's get some uh, some wine in our glasses, I suppose. I actually forgot to grab myself a glass, so I'm going to slip past here. And I actually got started early. We, like, balance out that way, you know. So I'm going to get the chalice today. Isn't that pretty? I got my glasses from the thrift store, largely. I got some, like, fancy professional ones, too. But I think it's way more fun to drink wine out of a crazy glass. We use mason jars here a lot, but we mix it up. So, this first wine, the L2 Urban Flora Rosé, is 
a unique style of rosé. The the kind of old school rosés, you know, there was all there's all range of rosés throughout history. A rosé is basically just it is a red grape made more like a white wine. So whereas most red wines are made by fermenting the juice and skins together, so the color from the skins, the red purple grapes extracts into the juice and makes the wine colorful, makes it a red wine. But if you just ferment the juice of a red wine, similar to how you tend to just ferment the juice of a white wine, then you don't get so much color. You can get a very light wine. So rosés are just lighter red wines with less contact with that skin to extract the color, the dryness of a red wine, but you still get some of that sort of red fruit flavor without it being as intense as a normal red wine. Well, that being said, there's been all number. I mean, anything from almost white to almost red in the spectrum of rosé wines throughout history. But there was something that happened a few, about 10, 20 years ago. Some people may remember this. White Zinfandel became like the rosé. They called it white Zinfandel. It's from the Zinfandel grape here in California. And it it makes, a, a, it tended to be made in a style that was very sweet. It was super fruity. It was a little darker, kind of like our color, but it was really sweet. So white Zinfandel isn't a different grape varietal. It's the same, but with no skins. And a rosé is just minor skin contact. Yeah, exactly. So, um, except that the, the white Zinfandel did have some color to it. And it was, it was a decent amount of color. But rosé's got this bad rap because of that. Because white Zinfandel was incredibly popular. It's like a lot of what got a lot of Americans into drinking wine. Because mm-hmm. it was sweet. It was more like cocktails people were used to and so on. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Sweet wine's fine. It's, there's nothing wrong with sweet wine. It's just that in a certain crowds and as that style went away, you know, and it got out of fashion, it gave rosés a bad reputation. So people were like, oh, rosés aren't classy to drink. You know, it's not it's not serious wine. But then after enough time passed, people came back to rosé. And now there's all these, there's a huge trend towards rosé and this hashtag rosé all day and there's been rosé f- slushies at bars and uh, yeah, those I've really liked. Yeah. I'm normally like, not that I'm like a prim and fancy wine drinker, but I'm not normally like wine cooler type of. Yeah. But like at the fair, that was like one of the only bearable things to me. <laughs> Just going there and getting those rosé wine slushies and yeah. like hanging out. Oh well, well, shoot! At the fair great. on hot asphalt, like a slushy rosé sounds really refreshing. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, it made rosé fun again, but also, like, cool again. And making rosé fun again. Yeah. <laughs> right? I can get behind that slogan. Uh, so, but one side effect of that was that after the whole white Zinfandel thing, when rosé came back into fashion, everyone started making it bone dry with no sweetness. And because even if the wine wasn't sweet, if it was really fruity, people sometimes associated it as sweet. People weren't even making the rosé fruity anymore. They're making them really light, like almost like a white wine, with minimal fruit aromatics and no sweetness. So you ended up with this kind of flavorless rosé, which could be nice and refreshing when cold. And it's, it's a really nice style, and a lot of people are doing it. But I kind of went, okay, we're, you know, we're, everyone's getting too reactionary, too caught up in trends. I just want to make a rosé that's fun to drink and delicious. Um, this isn't sweet. It doesn't have residual sugar, but it is super fruity. I personally get a lot of watermelon, strawberry, cherry, kind of hibiscus, even like berry flavors, like, um, you know, raspberry or something. Or... Right. But along with that, it still has, uh, I want to say like herbaceous floral notes, mm-hmm. not like a uh, completely herbaceous, like it's not like uh, rosemary and oregano, right. but like mint and Thai basil, or even, I guess, even like Italian basil, sure. like yeah. really kind of sweet herbs yeah i can kind of see especially that thai basil where it's like almost a licorice note to it oh yeah it's got a little bit of anise yeah yeah i never really thought about that before but that's totally there so the way this one got a little bit of color to it is this is largely from barbera but also some pinot noir and for both of them i use the saunier technique which is where you crush the grapes you have contact between the juice and skins for a while for me it's generally about two days and then I drain the juice off of that. Sonye, it means to bleed in some language that's Latin. And um, it just makes a, that style, that approach makes a rosé with a little more color and a little more of that red fruit flavor. Um, yeah, it's a fun wine. Crisp and refreshing. I hope you guys like that. Uh, feel free to throw your comments out what you guys think. Do you think this perceives more on the sweet side or more on the crisp side? Um, 
yeah, how does this compare to other rosés in terms of style for you? And and what would you pair with it? Uh, mm. You guys kind of already know mine. I believe Kevin distributed them around. But uh, mm. what this makes me think of, and we touched on it with the fruitiness, with the herbaceousness. Uh, it, I think it goes well with a lot of things that are, you know, watermelon or cherry flavors or the Thai or, or mint. Mm. And ones that I had suggested with it is watermelon with mint and feta. It's a less little known combo, but you got the salty, you got the herbaceous, you got the sweet and juicy, and it just works real well. And two of those flavors really play with this, and the one kind of plays off of it, the feta, because it's different. It's that salty, but mm -hmm. which is opposite of this. But sometimes that works as a good pairing as well. Uh, I also, on the same note, think that spice or funk would work really well with this because it doesn't really have either. It's so sweet and so clean. And that's why I put Thai food with it a lot. And one in particular I have there is a, a cucumber salad from the north of Thai where you do cucumbers and mint and cilantro, Thai holy basil, and then fish sauce and Thai chilies to give it that heat and that funk uh, and some lime juice as well, or lemon, whatever citrus you have. But it'll give you this, like when we had our barbecue special, that went quite fast when we so were eating good. it here. <laughs> yeah. The spice just plays off of it. It, it just kind of complements this in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, I really love your food pairings. In Jerome's a much more creative cook than I. I. You know, we both like cooking, but he gets really creative as integration of different flavors and styles. You know, my, I put my creativity into the wine. For my food, it's usually just like a slop of healthy things. Um, so <laughs> I'm glad when Jerome does the cooking for our, uh, our pairing stuff or our get-togethers. Uh, but I do agree with you that kind of spicier food goes really nice with this because... You know, this wine isn't spicy or heavy or anything. It has more of a freshness. Mm -hmm. And so it goes really nicely with spicy things. I also think it pairs nicely with citrus because if you use this on something that was too sweet, like, you know, watermelon and mint isn't too sweet. If you did like chocolate or ice cream, I don't think, I think the acidity in this wine would pop too much. It would be too sour tasting for the wine. But something sour as well goes with this nicely because this wine isn't too sour on its own they kind of just play together and it actually makes the wine in some ways seem less sour so in that sense like tacos with some lime or if you were just you know you didn't have feta and mint just like watermelon with lime and salt would be really nice um makes me want to try it with some other things in that realm and like you know like would it be good with a green apple then as a pairing those ones that are just a little yeah. tart and maybe if you needed to bring it back to those other ways put it in some like you know, tahine, like the Mexican chili yeah. spite, you know, salt. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Good commentary. Cool. All right, sweet. All right, thank you, Zach, for fixing a uh, odd uh, repetition there. We had some sort of echo of us talking over each other. We just talk so fast, and we're talking over ourselves, actually. That wasn't a computer thing. That was just how we talk. Uh, space-time continuum. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on time travel and uh, space-time continuum destruction. Uh, yeah, on that note, actually, part of our new time travel routine is you can watch these videos at any time that you want. Uh, no, I mean, obviously that was kind of like a joke intro, but that is something we want to talk about more, is that while we do this live, and that's part of the fun of it, we can interact and you can see live performers and be a part of it. We can all join together. We like to think of ourselves as something like the Netflix or Hulu of wine tastings. Because, yeah, you can do it live, but you could also, any time after this, watch it. You don't have to think like, oh, I'm not free that night. I can't do that tasting. Do whatever other thing you have plans for these days. Uh, uh, or, yeah, I don't know if anybody has <laughs> plans these days. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, is that you don't have to have that weekend free or that night or specific hour available. Watch it later in your, you know, in your leisure. So uh, something we wanted to talk about more so that people don't feel constrained to try to catch it on time. It's fun interacting with you guys, but order them for later and do it when you're having a little party. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And that's one thing we've, uh, we've started to see more of is people checking these videos out, ordering the kits and checking out the videos like a week or two after the fact. So our, our bingo night we did last week um, is, or what, a couple week and a half ago, yeah, is still a huge hit. We're selling like tons of that after the fact because people just really like that activity. Yeah, we ship out like a few a day. So people are still like playing that game on like, you know, in the past, in the future. You right. know? I don't know. I'm, time is weird. Um, 
So yeah, okay. I always finish the wines with some, you know, atypical pairings. Of course, we've talked about the food pairings. I also do life pairings. Just kind of the lifestyle I see this wine suiting or situations where I would drink this wine. So for me, this wine is totally beach wine or festival wine, lakeside wine, you know, rafting down the American River wine, wine slushy wine. You get the theme. It's that kind of thing. You know, Gardening like, wine, I like to think of it ooh, as well. I think day. it's perfect for a day. I for the weather like this. Yeah. And then my um, my quote for this, my uh, literary pairing, so to speak, is uh, from Tom Robbins from Jitterbug Perfume. Uh, and the quote is, never underestimate how much assistance, how much satisfaction, how much comfort, how much soul and transcendence there might be in a well-made taco and a cold bottle of beer. Tacos would be a perfect pairing for this too. It's yeah. kind of why I chose it. I'm like, this is like, this is a wine that you would drink in situations you would drink with beer. <laughs> it's honestly like, it's just, it's a fun wine. It doesn't have to be taken too seriously. So, cool. Um, yeah, that that adds up the pairings. And the art for this is from Sacramento artist Micah Crandall Bear. All the lucid art is from him. And um, yeah, he's a really amazing artist. So, we're going to move into that second wine here. Go ahead and finish that guy. I'm uh, I'm gonna cleanse right now, <laughs> so I'm I'm not supposed to be drinking. So I'm just taking little micro sips because as a winemaker, anything less than one glass of wine is actually like how most people experience not drinking. It's essentially stasis for me. It's a, it's it's my baseline. So um, he needs a little bit to keep the jitters away. Is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I believe those are called delirium tremens, right? Yeah. Also, well, by the way, a really good beer. Uh, <laughs> that's a great potential band name. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too, yeah. um, so now we have our V for the source Pinot Noir Grenache. Um, yeah. I love the color on that. That like kind of like brick red, where it's got like a little bit of like brown, you know, like burnt look into it with yeah. it. Yeah, I love that sort of brick color. You get that usually in more aged wines and in lighter color sulfite-free wines because all of our wines are organically made, sulfite-free, vegan, all natural, all that good stuff, no additives. Those style tend to take on aged characteristics a little quicker. People always are afraid that natural wines won't age. But the fact of the matter is they do age beautifully. They just age at a more rapid rate because they don't have all the preservatives. So... This is a good thing, not a bad thing, actually. It means that if, as a natural winemaker, I'm releasing, you know, the 2020 or 2020 vintage already. Look at that. Oh, I'm really ahead of schedule. The 2019 vintage already, um, then it's going to be tasting ready. And whereas most winemakers would wait a year until it's ready. It's like, no, it's ready now. It's actually really delicious. And if you want a nicely aged style Pinot Noir that tastes like it's five years old and has some beautiful age character on it, like this is only two year old wine. It tastes beautiful, but there's a lot of styles of wine that you, you know, you really, the, the age characteristics you get at 10 and 15 years in terms of more, you know, spice and um, like tertiary characteristics of, you know, leather or tobacco or, or woodsiness, not in this wine so much, but in, in some of these wines you get in a wine at a little younger point in a natural style wine, which is really cool. I think you touched on something there. You know, I've got a little different perspective. My background isn't as much in wine, but I know wood pretty well. And you're saying it's got, you know, that he referenced woodsiness, but said, you know, but you won't taste it too much. But so this is aged on maple and cherry wood, which both are kind of, you know, ap, you know, not your normal things you age wine on. But the cherry, I think, particularly ties into what he is saying. Of all the woods, you know, this is maple. It's got the same character as when we put it here, other than the wine stains everywhere. But if this were cherry, it would be changing color very quickly. Mm. Of all your woods, your oak is very stable. Your cherry, it kind of morphs. Parts get lighter and darker. The, the swoops and swirls kind of change a little bit. It changes in character faster than any of the woods by far. It makes sense in an odd sort of way that your wine aged mm -hmm. on, because out of all of them, this has changed the most, the fastest in the flavor. It didn't yeah. even really have this like burnt umber color before. It really took it, it on. It was like, more like a light red, and that happened yeah, over, like you know, this 12, is a year and a half now. You yeah, know, 12, 16 months in, it's kind of turned this corner. Yeah. It, I just, I find that interesting that it behaves the way the wood it was aged on 
behaves. Yeah, I, I never thought about that before because I, I, the cherry, the influence of the cherry wood for me that I got initially was an enhancement of the cherry flavor that was already in the base wines. Pinot Noir and Grenache are prone to cherry flavors already. And then it also brought in like more of a, like a white pepper spice and the base wines, I had fermented on the stems a little bit um, to enhance something that's already naturally in Pinot Noir and Grenache, which is a little bit of black pepper and herbaceous notes. So for me, this the base wine already had like black pepper and like tomato leaf and, uh, you know, an herbaceous characteristic. And then bringing in that cherry wood with that white pepper just even more lifted that like peppery, spicy, herbaceous character. Uh, so the cherry kind of enhanced both the fruit and the spicy herbaceousness. But that is really interesting to see that it may have an effect, have had partially an effect on the color as well. I mean, that may just be a you know confirmation bias. I know the weird little obscure fact, and so I'm applying it to this unrelated thing, you know, mm -hmm. making causation out of correlation. But it, it does strike me that like you know of the few that you use the cherry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have the one that has shown that effect the most. Yeah. So. I think part of it also is just that lighter colored wines do tend to show more of that brick color. You'll see this in really nicely aged Pinot Noirs from uh, from Burgundy. So, um, so yeah, both organically grown. The Pinot Noir is from Santa Cruz Mountains area, and the Grenache is from Calaveras County from Star Canyon Ranch, a really cool spot on some limestone soils in pretty high elevation with just kind of a trippy terroir that brings in a lot of spiciness and smokiness. Um, so I think those two grape varieties, which you don't normally see blended, both bring in really nice fruit, but also spicy herbaceousness, which I just think this is such a fun wine for me. It's light enough that you can actually kind of drink this wine in the summertime if it's slightly chilled, but there's enough complexity and spice to it. That it is a really nice wintry drinker while still staying on the lighter side. Um, yeah. And then, the art for this wine is from Robert and Shauna Park Harrison. They're artists off the East Coast that I'm absolutely obsessed with. Um, that is called The Source and uh, just one of their beautiful pieces. Check out their art on their website. All of their stuff has this just really magical, surreal, dystopian vibe to it. Um, and my pairings for this wine, food pairings, first of all, we'll start there. Um, well, the fanciest food pairing on here is stolen directly from Chef Chris Barnum over at Locala, Sacramento, Sac uh, one of Sacramento's uh, Michelin noted restaurants and one of my favorite restaurants in the region. Uh, it's jerk quail with, with a little spice, with cornbread and ginger stuffing, black bean puree, carrot and cilantro slaw, micro cilantro. Oh yeah, and topped with a little micro cilantro. Um, so yeah, I think tying off that, um, I think the lighter colored meats, you know, stuff in this, you know, not your beef and your lamb, but more your, your chicken, your pork, your, you know, duck, your, um, rabbit, that kind of stuff could go really nicely with this wine because it is a lighter red, but it still has enough like funkiness to mm -hmm. go with something a little gamey, even like duck or, or rabbit. Um, I could see that. And then pair it with something maybe that plays on those other flavor profiles, pair mm -hmm. it with some, uh, some cherry or yeah. like, you know, like a berry, like you can even like make like a sauce with one of those yeah. in like a chili, like a really chipotle, you know, Ooh, raspberry yeah. jelly, you know, glaze on some pork. That'd be really good. Bring in that on fruit this. aspect, yeah. I tend to find a way to like tie in some kind of chili into just about everything. <laughs> all the so. all the spicy elements, yeah. Um, and then if you're not a meat eater, if you're vegetarian, you like cheeses. For me, I think because this does have some acidity to it as well as like some kind of complex spicy funkiness to it. I do think that slightly funkier or saltier cheeses go really well with this, like Asiago, um, even getting into like some smoked cheeses, uh, Gouda or something like that. You don't want something too funky. Like you don't want like blue cheese. That's going to overpower this wine. But I think something too simple, like, I mean, obviously not American cheese, but like, you know, even like a cheddar, like a, you know, a, a supermarket cheddar for me would be too light for this wine. This wine wants something just a little funkier to it. But, yeah, that's my, I think that's, that's right. I was trying to think when you started with the cheese. I wonder what kind he's going to say. I don't really know if mm. I see that, but that's a that's a perfect suggestion. Yeah. yeah, and um, and then olives and pickled veggies also go really nice with this wine. I think for me, just saltiness goes well. Yeah, that was one I doubted a month so much last time and tried it, and it was fantastic. I right? that. You're my favorite <laughs> is actually the pickled ginger with it. 
uh, oh, yeah, and that yeah. worked out really well. And interestingly, Chris used ginger in his dish. So uh, ginger seems to be something that goes with this wine nicely. So yeah, yeah what do you know? Uh, my other well, pairing... Ginger goes well with cherry also. So that could be by, oh. you know, going in an Asian direction almost. Yeah. There. yeah, there's an interesting thing with food and wine pairing is like you can either play off elements of the wine. Like the wine has cherry fruit, so you use cherry to enhance that characteristic. The wine has like a gingery spice component. Use ginger to enhance that. Or you can like counterpoint. If you think a wine doesn't have something that you wish that wine had, and there's not enough acidity, you can use some acidity in your food to kind of like add that to the balance. You have to think of the food as part, like the wine food as one, essentially. It's almost like your your wine is like one more thing you're adding to your food. It's another ingredient or another spice. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, oh yes, my literary pairing for this is... Um, from Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own, and the quote is, One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. That seemed appropriate. Um, and, yeah, the, uh, the music pairing for this is The Sound of Sunshine Going Down by Michael Franti. Because I think this is like a summertime red in the sense that it's lighter and can be chilled nicely. But it, it's, it's not like summer daytime like that last one. This is more like when sunshine's going down, you know, kind of like your summertime sunset. So it's starting to cool down a little bit. You know, you're putting a sweater on over your swimsuit kind of thing. You know, like that's the vibe. <laughs> so one of those really little white things. It's kind of like a rope, but you can see right. Through right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It looks like you're wearing like a sweater or overcoat, but it's actually just like, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, cool. All right. Uh, so now we finished the second wine. Um, cause you wouldn't wear like a coat with your swimsuit. That makes no, no it's, sense, so. yeah, it's not going to be like uh, a yeah. swimsuit and trench coat. That would be a little awkward. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, okay. Now sorry. we're going to take a break from us and we are going to play our live. Well, it's, it's our semi live performance. So this was recorded special for us last night. Uh, by J.B. Hall and Zephyr Bacterium, Sacramento's uh, DJ who plays uh, all around and uh, on 94.7, a local radio station. He plays a big set there. Um, J.B. performs all around town. She goes by Sparkle Mermaid oftentimes, and she's at mermaid conventions and fire flow conventions everywhere. She awesome also performer. does like mermaid events. If you got a kid cut, has a birthday party coming yeah. up, you know, and like she'll... She also does sparkly wine bottles. Oh, Where is her sparkly there. wine bottle? Um, she made us a really cool sparkly wine bottle once. You know, she is the sparkle mermaid, so it's coming, a true to uh, form. Coming to a subscription box near you soon. Yeah. So it's uh, one of these bottles. Actually, this is the rosé that we drank first, but with uh, glitter sparkles all over it and a spiral uh, bamboo. So, uh, yeah, she bedazzled them excellently. Um, yeah, and and a huge uh, supporter of us. So thank you, JB, for your uh, support and your awesome performance. We're going to cue her on right now. Hope you guys enjoy this performance.
is because the purple color that's in the grape goes into the juice and into the ultimate. Yeah. They put like grapes there and then they add a... Hello, hello, welcome back. And uh, some applause for JB and Zephyr. Well, I mean, still, you gotta watch the screen. It's still there. Oh, yeah? Time I think we're live. That's just behind you. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how time works. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lag on the video. It's time travel. Yeah. It's like when I was explaining to my nephew once that when I was coming from overseas that it had been the next day where I was, and it was now this day then, and they were like, thought I was a time traveler for years. It was really great. Uh, yeah, five-year-olds are notoriously like the, not the best with time zones. <laughs> 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 um, all right. So I swear we're not drunk. Uh, we're uh, <laughs> oh maybe a little bit, but um, we are ready for the next wine, the L three Manifesto Barbera. So drum, there we go. It's like I almost let the bottle go right as. <laughs> um, so this wine is now we're getting into like medium. <laughs> he was just he, he had trusted me enough. He thought I'd catch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, the L three Manifesto Barbera is is like getting to more medium bodied red wine. You're, you're going to be getting it's still lighter in the palate, like it's nice and smooth, but aromatically you're getting darker fruits. For me, I get like uh, blackberry, plum, some pomegranate. Yeah, I really get that plum a lot in there. Like nice Santa Rosa plums. You're like deep dark ones. Mm, yeah, it's got nice, some, you know, some black cherries as well. Too. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm actually making some some literally plum wine right now as a homebrew ferment. I do all sorts of crazy ferments other than wine wine, but don't really release them generally. Um, although I, I made down the line, but for now that's just for homebrew tasting. But yeah, you get kind of some of that, definitely some of that plum characteristic. But also I think this wine has, whereas a lot of red wines aim more towards like a heavy tannic quality. This one for me, if anything, has a little more acidity to it. Yeah, so, it's very little tannins yeah. in there. I think that's what makes me describe it as the one that's just like an adult grape juice. And I know that's literally what they all are, but it, it's just so like clean and, and smooth. It doesn't have like the spiciness, those heavy tannins, any of the sugar. You know, it's just, it tastes really much like the grapes, like yeah. the, the berries and fruit. It's and nice. a, a big part of that comes from the fact that... For fermentation with of red grapes, when you ferment on the skins, you have a couple of choices. You can crush those grapes really heavily, so like you release all the juice and the skins are still there. But you know, you're, you're when you do that, you tend to extract like all the characteristics from the skins. So you get more color, and you can also get um, a really tannic quality, like a really bitter astringent quality. And that's how most darker red wines are made. To make a, a red wine that has you know some dark color but it's just a little lighter in the palate. You want to leave some of those berries not completely crushed. So on this, I used a certain percentage of whole berry. You say a certain percentage. That tells us nothing. What does that mean? Right. Uh, what is so most, most fermentations would be none. Yeah. Percentage, you know? so, so I think, you know, I honestly couldn't remember. It was about that big, but <laughs> okay. I, it, it would be about 50%. Double speak or whatever. Yeah. It. yeah. It's, um, it, because what I did was, with the thing that crushes them, I opened it up a little bit. So it was an imper inexact percentage, but I opened it up a little bit. So some fall through without crushing, some crush lightly, and some still crush all the way. So you get this nice mix, uh, but you don't yeah, get it's, it. It's a certain percentage. 
we're certain that we have no idea what the percentage <laughs> is. Like, because technically <laughs> zero and 100 are percentages. So yeah, yeah this could be... Certain it's somewhere between those. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so you get a little bit of a lighter palette because of that technique. But then uh, in addition to that, I used a little bit of cherry wood and maple, similar to that last wine. But for this one, a little bit more so of the maple. And the, I think the maple for me comes through a little more on this wine. You get just almost that like maple molasses-y aromatic. It's not like sweet at all. It's not a sweetness that gives it. It's more the aroma of maple that comes through more than anything. So what on, on this one gives it, because this is another one. It's almost like these are the first three kind of our three, your three most color spectacular wines. This one's got like a very like purple red going mm -hmm. on. Like it's almost like violet, like a neon violet type of look. Uh, like I've kind of seen that burnt, umber type of look before but where is this just the grape varietals is this the so process one of the what? aspects of this is that when wine grapes when fermentation is just happening when you're extracting that color from the grapes mm -hmm. you're gonna see a almost fluorescent purple color it's crazy like this, so yeah. yeah and it's even more so than this mm -hmm. it, it's it's pretty wild it's almost like this this bright violet thing and that's because the thing that gives grapes their color are called anthocyanins. And those, when they're just like freshened, technically, I'm trying to think of a way to explain the term monomers, when they're when it's just the anthocyanin by itself without a bunch of things attached to it. So when it's fresh and young and just extracted, it has this bright purple color. And then over time, what happens is it, it combines with oxygen and astringent molecules in the wine, other tannins and polyphenols. Um, and it combines with these things and those reactions make the wine go from bright purple to like a light purple um, that's more like what you see in, in red wines and eventually to more of a red and eventually to brick red. But this wine, so so a wine that's very young has more of that purpley fluorescent purple color. So is this younger or, or did you halt that process somehow? So this is, a, this is younger. I bottled this one, probably younger than anything else I bottled. So... It was a very purpley wine in the first place. Mm. And because of that whole berry technique, it was more fresh fruit and light characteristics. So that's probably also some of what I'm tasting. It hasn't developed those that. complexity that it would. It's still first day chili. Or yeah, it's, I, I kind of freeze framed it in a more fresh fruit style, which comes through in the color as well. So would, um, can you, in a sense, by looking at a wine's color, determine that, okay, this is kind yeah. of fluorescent purple. It's real young. This is kind of that yeah. darker brown, burnt umber. It's got orange, in, you know, like this is an older wine. And this is just like a clear red. It's in middle age or whatever you yeah, call it. Can you kind of like fact, see that spectrum in the... Absolutely. Well, that's and, a real like, why, that's like a total like winemaker hack. You could go to like some winery and swirl it around and just like, yeah. oh, very, you know, bottled young or whatever. Like, and just totally. know, know that shit. It's, it's a fun little trick. It's like, yeah, it's a little magic trick. So how have you never told that before? This is like episode 14. Right? Yeah. You know, to be honest, I, like, I, I know we have some repeat viewers. So I was like, I felt like repetitive, you know, like your dad or mom who makes the same joke or tells the same story from when they're in college or whatever all the time. And I, I do that all the time. I felt that way about some of my like, you know, pairings and quotes and descriptions of the wine. I was like, I have people watching again. Let me, let me talk some of like the deeper geekery I don't usually go into of like technique. So today I'm giving you guys a little bit more of like of the details. Um, but yeah, it, during Somali training and during winemaking training, they that's one of the things, you know, if you guys have ever watched the movie Psalm or like heard about, you know, oh, Somalis can like deductively tell you what, what a wine is, you know, and sit there and smell it and go, this is a 2013 Cote d'Aron uh, from a higher end producer. And, you know, what they're doing is they're literally like, it's deductive reasoning. They use Sherlock Holmes reasoning where they, um, they like sommelier is smiling in the background. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, been he's, through this. he's gone through some of this training. And, uh, Zach's done that. Yeah. That training as well. It's Kevin. I'm yeah. just <laughs> drums, bullshitting on Drums here. has got a really okay. good palate and, and bullshitting skill. Um, but, it up. <laughs> but yeah, so you'll look at the wine and you'll go, okay, what color is it? It's, if it's light, it might be Pinot Noir Grenache. If it's medium, it might be Barbera Zinfandel. If it's really dark, it's probably like, Cabernet Sauvignon or Petit Syrah. And then you go, okay, so now I kind of know the variety. And if you go, oh, it's really fresh in color, like more fluorescent-y, it's probably young. Or if it's more brick, it's probably old. If it's in the middle, it's probably medium old. Cool, that tells you a little bit. If it's a little more fruit forward in characteristic, people tend to say it's 
new world, like California wines, uh, Argentinian wines, uh, tends to be Australian wines tend to be a little more fruit forward in style, just in general. This of course varies producer to producer, but in general, and if it's like funkier and spicier and, you know, more of those age characteristics, you tend to see that more in European wines. So they use these, these like, Rules of thumb. Do they call it old world or they call it European? They call it old world. To. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a funny term, but yeah, the old world. Yeah. Well, but, no, yeah, and that makes sense. I had always thought of it as like Americanized and, you know, like uh, uh, old the, the world. OG I mean, I don't know if that's the term I would have come for, but or, uh, but new world and old world that makes sense. Yeah. You know. Uh, so yeah, so uh, this wine is definitely in a new world style. The the V for the source. I've had a lot of people tell me that they would never guess it was a new world wine. They would have thought that was an old world wine just because it has more of that age characteristic, a little more of that spice and earthiness, and just overall comes across as a more old world wine. Yeah. Should, should we jump into food pairings? I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So this one is maybe the best food pairing I, I feel like I've come up with for your food. And I do this again for the summertime barbecue, but. I suggest it with pork tenderloin or you could do it with pork chop. But what I ended up doing it with was tofu. And I'm personally not going to change that again. I loved the way it came out. Took tofu and grilled it up. You could also give it a hard sear in cast iron. You'd want to drain the liquid first. But with a dark cocoa, salt, and black pepper rub on it. And I think that we didn't touch on it a whole lot, but as well as like the dark fruit, this has kind of some cocoa notes, some of those dark, uh, like warming spices almost. Mm -hmm. And it kind of plays off of that. Uh, and then we had it with a hoisin <clears throat> sauce. I, I said I was going to make house made, but, or the house hoisin sauce, but we didn't end up having time. So I just used the stuff I had at my house. Uh, I think I was technically still correct. But yeah, the uh, it plays with those dark stone fruit flavors that it has, like the plum mm -hmm, type mm -hmm. of notes, and worked out really well. Uh, and by the same note, st any st dark stone fruit, and especially if grilled, would work really well with this because the grill will bring out some of the caramelization, uh, which will tie in with that warm baking spice and also bring out the sugars themselves and develop those, which will tie into like the nice fruity nature of it. Uh, and I know you, you've got some other things as well, but those are the, yeah. the things that I paired with this that I thought worked out fantastically. So, yeah. So, um, I have Jerome, like I say, he's the main food pairing guy. So I let him kind of take the, take the mic for those periods. Uh, but you know, in addition to what he said, for me, I just have a little bit more straightforward stuff. The, the easy finger foods. I do think that any of those sort of fruits that he's mentioned already, like grilling to do all these cool things with, just having those fruits straightforward with this wine can go really nicely. Um, as well as kind of more your mild soft cheeses. The more basic like cheddar, Swiss Munster can be really nice with this. They're just smooth, creamy, you know, a little bit of cheesy flavor, a little saltiness, but not too overboard. And so this is kind of a nicely balanced wine. I think that goes well. Um, and then, you know, this is this is one that for me, because it is in the middle, I still don't want to do steak or gamey stuff with it too heavily. I want something that's in the middle, a, a kind of a middle meat. You know, uh, pork can be a really good pairing for this. I mean, you, you could do beef, if, but, it, you know, it's not like a big steak wine. You know, maybe more of just like a simple sear or something. Uh, I agree with you there. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so kind of it's, this is a wine that can do well with food, especially the drums pairings, but this is also just in many ways, a nice drinking wine. I think it's just, this is your Tuesday night, like fun. It's got good dark fruit, but it's not too heavy, not too complex, just fun wine to drink. Yeah. And, and kind of on that. So it's like the same Barbera grapes used for the Rosé are done in the Barbera, uh, as a red. It's just, this is done without skins to, to give you. Or maybe it's with lesser skins to, to give you the Barbera Rosé. And then this is giving you... So it's the same. That's why you have this similar fruitiness in both. But it's just like a light summer fruit like watermelon or strawberries. And this has got your darker fruit like your blackberries or your, your black cherries. So it's very much the same type of thing where it's just, you know, same as this is picnicking or gardening or like, you know, a hot summer day type of thing. This is like a nighttime version of what this is the day of. So as it starts chilling down and you're just, you know, like you said, want to enjoy it a little bit, 
uh, it's the same type of thing where you're just you're doing a little eve, you know middle of the night moonlight gardening or you know flooding down the river in the evening it's the same type of wine and life experience just a night versus day version yeah, so. yeah um all right we're going to transition from that into the fourth wine the l5 primal syrah so the syrah thank you um this is maybe it, it's like tied for my favorite i really like the Pacite syrah too but this one for me gets into an even darker fruit area you're getting into well it's it's it, you know blackberry and plum are already pretty dark fruits it's hard to get much darker than that but you're, you're definitely getting like in mulberry and cassis flavor characteristic but what was the other one cassis uh, cassis i don't know it's one of those words that i actually can't pronounce um yeah it's uh, yeah, I don't you know, know, I elderberry know. like these sort of really dark berry flavors but also for me you you it's also getting into a meaty spicy like Obviously, there's no meat in it, but there's like this, it's almost meaty, gamey, black pepper, leather, tobacco. For me, I get aspects of that that are coming through more and more with age, and I really enjoy. It's primal, you know, yeah. as the the name implies, and I know some of that goes with the artwork, or, but this is a very primal. It's got a lot of those yeah. like raw, like intense flavors, and it's also why this is largely considered like the best like romantic date night wine because it's really it's just, just luscious and smooth and you know full body and well and that wasn't even like but yeah it, it yeah. really is just like a nice uh <laughs> powerful wine I, I really like this one uh where it's like a lot of other these are some of my favorites for just you know casual drinking yeah this one is kind of an occasion wine you know it packs a punch yeah, and it makes sense too. I mean, it's it's it has that extra complexity to it. It also has a little more price point associated with it. It's not too expensive uh, for our lineup, and you know, it's thirty eight dollars though. So we have some stuff at eighteen and twenty eight that are a little more affordable. You know, everyday wines. This one's definitely like you know a little more in that special category, and it's also been a little more highly rated. It got ninety two points from Wine Enthusiast as a tiny winery. That seems like a lot. Yeah, I think that's that's a high number. Huh. It's it's out of uh, it's out of two thousand actually, so it's not. That <laughs> uh, but it's actually only a ninety two point scale. <laughs> <laughs> weird, um, weird. So so no, um, you know, fancy wine magazine and stuff, and they normally don't rate little tiny micro wineries operating out of warehouses making four hundred bottles of this wine, something like that. Um, so to get even rated is crazy. That but they know me as a winemaker from my other projects and. Uh, yeah, got a good rating on it. It's a fancy wine. You should be impressed. It really is. Like you know, like I was saying last show with a different wine, but you can kind of you can tell. I mean, these wines are fantastic, but they are, like I said, they're easy drinking. Like they're you know they're higher end. They're not like the stuff I'd get off the store shelf. But you know, like you can tell that when you get to this one, that this is the one that's got like that extra care, that extra character. You know, and and it's. You know, it's worth the extra price. You yeah. can taste it when you get to it. Yeah. It's like it, something made uh, with a better ingredient. Somebody yeah. cooked you a, you know, a good, high quality steak rather than, you know, something that wasn't. Yeah. On that note, good transition to our pairings for this. So, you know, I'll, I'll start this off just because I probably have less cool things to say. Oh, I don't know if I really have ah, pairings right. for this. Did I, do I have anything? Well, well then on that note, I'll start because I have pairings. <laughs> Um, so yeah, for this, I definitely, this is your steak wine for me. Um, this could also go with lamb. This does have enough weight, but enough gaminess to go with that really nicely. Um, this can also go with like, you know, a more flavorful sausage. And if you're a vegan, this is definitely where you can bring in a, uh, like a more flavorful vegan sausage. Um, not your super simple one, maybe you know, something with more of an andouille or Italian spice, like a little more spice to it and flavor. I could see this as well as like a really good pairing with like a mixed mushroom dish mm -hmm. where you've got like portobellos and shiitakes, oyster mushrooms, yeah. just like some salt and pepper and then just like, you know, cook them all up. Like I could really see that working with this. Yeah, I think this wine in particular with shiitake, I think one of our pairing things, I believe you had some like old shiitake or something you had some crazy thing it was anyway it was like shiitake influence and you definitely you see that uh pairing really nice with this i think you can also get into 
if whatever how you're cooking those meats or your sausage or even a tofu in a darker sauce i think although you use the hoisin on the last one you could definitely use hoisin here soy barbecue sauce kind of those darker sauces in general i actually get some like almost soy notes in this wine um this one is also aged on maple and hickory you do get some of that maple characteristic and almost maple molasses thing coming through as well as a little bit of that hickory smokiness um which all of those components the wine and the woods to me this could go with you know something as intense as a blue cheese but also like a manchego asiago some smoked gouda for that smokiness in this wine um and you know, for the vegans, it, I think this is something that also goes really nice with kind of the roasted saltier nuts like Brazil nuts, pecans, walnuts, um, and definitely some of that roasted and definitely you want some saltiness there. Wine and food, it's all about like, if, if all else fails, if you can't even think about anything, you're like, I don't even know what's going to pair with this. Their whole flavor thing they're talking about is just too much salty and rich, like fatty, oily, salty. Like you cannot go wrong if you pair those things with food that with wine. The like the last you know a little while of him talking about that there, and I actually do have a food pairing right. now based he came on. Up with something. We're talking right. about the soy and the fattiness and those other things. It's a, a kind of a traditional Chinese way of doing it. There's a sauce that you can make using like oyster sauce, which is very much like fish sauce, you know, and that it's just you know oy oysters packed in salt, and then they like drain off the fluid from it more or less. But uh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, but ah. yeah, mixing that with uh, with you know some water, uh, some sugar, maybe some you know some soy, and you make like a nice sauce for it, and then cooking either like pork belly or it might seem weird for like a heavier red, but something like a, a fatty fish, like maybe salmon or something, mm -hmm. and just cooking it down in your wok, and you let it cook in the sauce while the sauce is reducing so you end up with like this thick salty fatty rich sauce and you can do things like throw shallots or throw garlic in there but you know ginger or whatever works for you mm -hmm. but doing that sauce where it's the oyster sauce the soy sauce the water a little bit of like sugar like brown, yeah and then just cooking down because you're it's sort of sitting there and it's still going to sear on the bottom because it's so thin but that sauce reduces around it and it kind of braises it. Uh, and yeah, I would do that, that good. With this. And I do think that would also be, you know, despite the oyster sauce, like a fantastic date night dish where it's yeah. fatty and rich and it's one bowl and you guys are sharing like one milkshake, two straws style. Like, uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> just yeah, me. Um... <laughs> I had a I had a comment there and I just totally <laughs> lost it because <laughs> just... you pictured me and you drinking oyster sauce out of a, <laughs> yeah, out of yeah. a walk with um, straws. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I remember that. I'm gonna say it even this is funny. I, I, I can't forget it again. Um, so when you're with another little winemaker hack, if all else fails, if you're ever out wine tasting, and this is gonna tie into food pairing here in a second, if you're ever out wine tasting, and someone pours you some wine and goes, what? aromatics do you get in this wine what flavors do you perceive you know and you're like you're totally intimidated you're like oh shit i'm on the spot you know you and you're like i don't know anything about wine like i don't know the flavors of this wine here's a really great way to bullshit like every single wine you're gonna be about 80 percent right describe things that are the same color as the wine works it's it's i don't know there's like some science behind it but i'm not getting into it it's mostly true it's like a white wine fish yeah, yeah. Listen, like, fish, sit, lemon, okay, you're, you you hop, know, like, you're hopping to the to the pairing thing. It doesn't smell like fish, but uh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, first okay. is the flavor of the wine. So like okay. the lemon works. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a white wine. You're gonna get you know you think pear, apple, lemon. You know, okay, yeah, that, okay, I can see that. Uh, when you get into rosé, you're thinking like pink things. You know, like oh roses, strawberry, watermelon. You get into red wine. You know, more red color. You're gonna get like strawberry, cherry. You get into a dark red wine, like purpley dark wine, you're going to have like blackberry and plum and, and spicy things and so on. So it's like match the color and you can bullshit it pretty effectively. But um, for the food pairings, you're going to see a uh, kind of similar thing. So white wine tends to pair well with like fish and chicken and lighter meats, you know, your tofu with a less intense flavor, red wines with red meat and so on. Now this is really commonly known oh red wine you know red meats 
white wine, white meats, etc. But one of the tricks, one of the things behind this is actually if you take a white meat and you flavor it intensely, so darker flavors, darker sauces, you kind of shift it towards a darker component where you could do chicken with red wine just with a darker sauce. You could do darker meats or mushrooms with a white wine or rosé maybe, but just make it fresher and lighter. Don't like push it towards lightness, like maybe more citrus, so on. So you can kind of play with that, like the color matching of wine and food for a flavor balance. So, so that's like, you know, what spawned that thought is me putting a fish as a pairing for this, yeah. but using something that's at the very dark end of the spectrum Actually, to sort of bring it to where exactly. we needed to match that wine. That makes, so, makes sense. It's a really cool, fun aspect of that. And then I'm going to end this wine with a uh, literary pairing. And this is from W.C. Fields. And he says, I cook with wine. Sometimes I even add it to the food. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Um, and now you can point. We have to state that since we don't have a laugh track. You guys need to know. One Zach. No. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I was Thank not expecting that. <laughs> um, Zach's awesome. Um, so this last wine, Elliot Wanderlust Red Blend. We're going to talk about this more in a second, but we're going to take a quick second here while you guys are sipping on this wine and getting started to show you our um, our wine tasting kits and subscription boxes. If you haven't checked them out in the past, most of you guys are here have, know these, so we're not going to stay on this for too long, but we're going to show you that real quick while you get a sip on here. And, um, and you going to uh, work the yeah. camera for me, Kevin? Yeah, I'll get that. Maybe flip the mic around as well. I got you, boo. I realize that you need to do some more adjustments here. This is $19, is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. 19 bucks for a 50 milk kit, right? Uh, yes, that is correct. All right. So what I'm going to show you here is a couple of things. First of all, and pretty much everyone, I think, checking it out here already has some version of this. But these are different tasting kit options. So we've just updated our 25 mil to 50 mil. And the reason I still have this like handwritten adjusted sign is because we're still in the process of switching over. This is your current 25 milliliter, which we are doubling in sizes are small, but as of now, you guys are still getting two of this if you're ordering the 50 milliliter. Uh, and that's just to make it accessible to everybody so that everybody can enjoy this type of thing. The 100 milliliter kit is your next step up that's most of a glass of each wine. So you end up getting two thirds of a bottle and then you get to taste all five wines. This is more like a full tasting kit for somebody who, you know, wants to really enjoy the evening. The next step up would be two of the 50 milliliter kits plus a bottle, which you pay a little bit more for, but it's still a big discount over getting the wines and you get a chance to really enjoy this and then still have enough to complete your evening. The five bottle pack, your biggest deal, you get a great price per bottle. And if you're going to be drinking it eventually anyway, if you want to support, it's the most bang for your buck. Over here also have some of our subscription options. Uh, the subscription package is one to three bottles and you get to choose lucid or voluptuary or mixed and you get it monthly along with free shipping or delivery and a gift and it varies per month you get all sorts of options like candles and cutting boards and uh you know art uh jewelry and coloring books but it gives you another opportunity to give back to the community to get some really cool life useful things and to be honest, get your wine on a big discount. You'll end up getting a lot of other freebies like VIP treatment at any events we're allowed to have post-apocalypse. And, you know, we'll hook you up with, you know, little freebies and, and kits and whatnot where we can. So it's just a good way to support us and take care of yourself at the same time. Because all of these really are better deals than just buying the wine and gives you an opportunity to support us long term as well so thank you for that going back behind the curtain
Hello, hello. Welcome back to the stage. Our I'm over slab here. of maple on top of some wood. Drum magically transported over to the stage area. Um, so, yeah. Okay, we're on the L8 Wanderlust Red Blend. And thank you, Jerome, for that uh, beautiful introduction of our, or description of our subscriptions. Did you pour me? Description of our subscription? This is the L8 now. I didn't pour anything, actually. I think you poured it. Did I do that? Yeah. Uh, it was so long ago. I'm sorry. I, yeah, just, I, was, I was like, this smells like zone. the L8. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the L8 <laughs> Wanderlust Red Blend. <laughs> uh, the L8 Wanderlust Red Blend is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, 50%, with 25% Barbera and 25% Zinfandel. Um, it, I call it my Foothills Blend, because in the Sierra Nevada Foothills here of California, we are famous for our Zinfandel and our Barbera in the Foothills. That's like the grapes of the California Foothills. And I think Barbera comes through with like more crispness, of acidity as well as fresh fruit, as you've seen in the Barbera. Yeah, you got a chance to taste the Barbera right. that's a quarter of this, yeah. Exactly. And then Zinfandel tends to be like even darker fruit, like blackberry and jam and raisins almost. So you get some of that characteristic. And those are the two grapes of the foothills. Meanwhile, Cabernet Sauvignon is like the grape. When a lot of people think of red wine, they think Cab. And it's also the base of the great Bordeaux blends, probably the most famous blends in the world. So I thought, well, let's make a foothill blend. That's like foothills Cabernet Sauvignon as the basis, as the king of wines and king of blends, and then have the Barbarian Zinfandel as like the rest of the team to put together this, this blend. So all of it picked very ripe later during harvest when the grapes are a little bit more sugary, a little riper. So you get a lot of dark fruit coming through. Um, it also means it's a higher alcohol wine. You're, the more sugar, the more conversion to alcohol. There's a kind of a ratio yeast produce sugar into alcohol. It's the most magical equation on earth. Um, yeah, point, point five eight, uh, oh, of alcohol produced per amount of one of sugar. <laughs> you memorized I told you I'm picking that yeah, shit up. Yeah. Like. Um, so yeah, that's the conversion. And so you know, this were, these are picked probably around 27 bricks on average, um, which percent sugar is bricks, the term we use, which... You can do the math, but that's going to come out to like 15 something. So this is like 15.2% alcohol, pretty beast of a wine. This one bottle of wine has more alcohol than a six pack of PBR. Believe it or not, I've done the math. Um, that was on our trivia night, actually. And Yeah, you guys may remember that as the night that nobody got any answers right on every, anything because they were things like that. Yeah, I, I thought they were straightforward <laughs> questions, but it turns out they were like straightforward to a highly qualified winemaker slash sommelier slash wine business graduate <laughs> which i didn't realize like yeah um so next trivia night they're going to be way easier we're actually going to do another trivia can night. i can i do the trivia night questions <laughs> then because like everybody went a bingo <laughs> yeah i know right we did a bingo night a couple weeks ago and literally like everyone got bingo someone got bingo three times <laughs> Whoa, I don't even know that's that. a good I'm night just, yeah <laughs> Um, sorry. So yeah, he'll, he'll, children watching this. Yeah. Um, okay. So, like I said, these are foothills grapes, sustainably grown, but not not organically certified. Um, and it's still for us just a fun wine. I did enhance like it's already dark fruit and boozy and just a, a rich wine that has an almost like dry pork characteristic to it. But I aged this on a pretty good amount of oak. I don't use a whole lot of oak in my wines in general. This wine has the most of any of my wines. Um, mostly French oak, some American oak. Some of the American oak was whiskey charred oak. So you get some of that smokiness. We also use some maple and hickory. So you get a little bit of that maple richness, some of that hickory smokiness as well. And it's just sort of hickory characteristic. Um, and it just lends to the complexity of this wine. So you have like a rich dark fruit wine, but with all this kind of complex stuff going on. So I've had, you know, really fancy wine folk say, oh, this is my favorite wine of yours. And it's also just our favorite amongst like people who like drinking. Yeah, like it's drinking. my favorite. It was our dad's favorite. It really is like, well, it's got that nice, like smoky, dark, you know, like whiskey quality, you know, where you want to just mm -hmm. sip it in your smoking den. But it also just, it's got that fruitiness. It's got those caramel notes where you could also... You know, just drink it casually. I yeah. think this has a very broad appeal to it. I, I quite yeah. like it. There's, there's a reason why it's our most popular wine. It's also eighteen dollars. <laughs> the wines that went into it are... and our highest alcohol, low, so lowest price, highest alcohol content, and the darkest, smokiest, 
most complex of all the wines. So. And it's a wine that the three wines that went into it on their own are priced at $38, $38, $28, something like that. And this one's 18 So it's like, why is this cheaper when it's like our most popular blend, our most popular wine, and it's composed of more expensive wines? There's really no reason. I just wanted to make a red wine that would be really popular that would sell like crazy. And I don't make money on this wine. This is like my lost leader, they call it in business. I just really want people to drink my wine, love it, and then come buy more of my wines. So I'm willing to lose money on this for you guys to have an awesome wine at a good price point. While my other ones are the ones where I actually don't lose money. Uh, so yeah, drink this wine. It's a good deal. Um, so let's hop into some food pairings here. Um, this is also a steak wine for sure. My pairings on this like sound kind of like the last one because they're both very dark and rich. I think you can go with gaming meats again, but this one I would say you really want that meat on the grill. I think this has that smokiness and you really want, and if you're going to do veggie stuff, you know, grilled tofu, uh, grilled, you know, uh, mushroom, possible like burger, mushrooms. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I agree completely on this. That was actually like you said it there. That was exactly what I was thinking either want to do this over like an open fire and you get the like char marks on it or a cast iron for the same reason. Mm, yeah. Like, you know, a flank steak, a, a nice, you know, like, well, a lot of cuts of steak with this. So, or like you said, like something like a mushroom or even mm. like a, a, a duck breast, you know, I, it could be really good with this. But only if you're doing it in such a way that you're going to get that heavy sear and get that yeah. like Maillard reaction where where it just turns like brown and like crispy on the outside and like the fat renders yeah. down internally. Another? Like, oh, no, no, it's just yeah, yeah, it's waxy and philosophical, but yeah. Um, but yeah, another thing to tie into that. Sorry, I got excited because I thought of okay. One of the things with wine is if you get like smoky characteristics, and sometimes this comes through as coffee or like. Um, caramel, smoky, so caramel, these sort of things. A lot of that comes not from the grape, but from the, the barrel that it's aged in. The oak, traditionally. For us, we use other woods as well. And the reason for that is because when you think of caramelization, what is caramelization? It's sugars, which through a, a heated reaction are warmed up and they literally go through a, a chemical reaction called caramelization. The, the, this is an equation for this. Sugar turns into like Crystals melt and then recrystallize in a different structure. Due to exactly. The yeah. And you get caramelized flavor. Um, well, in oak, in oak wood, also in other woods, there are literally wood sugars. There's sugars in wood. I know you can't like lick wood and be like, oh, that's sweet. But there are sugars in there. There's not a whole lot of them, but there's enough of them in there that when you actually heat wood, then you'll get caramelization. So barrels aren't just raw wood you put wine in. The wood on the inside, the outside's raw, but on the inside, they've actually toasted the the, the wood. What and do they, like, what temperature do they do that to? And what's the process for that? Do they do it prior to making yeah. the barrel? Do yeah. they go in there with the... So they take the staves, the side of the barrel, the long pieces, and they, they usually, like, have it almost half built. So they use these hoops to kind of hold it in almost a TP shape. So it's like half formed barrel in a, in a kind of funnel shape, almost like a teepee. Mm -hmm. And they have a fire underneath it. Traditionally, this was when they were making the barrel, the off cuts, the extra pieces of wood, they used that extra pieces of oak to build an oak fire underneath. And there was an experienced man who knew exactly what level of fire to keep going right, for how long to create the light. If right they're burning, stuff. they're going to be burning at the temperature with to ignite the stuff above, unless you're managing it right, making sure you're working off yeah. embers because it, uh, I think yeah. it's about 500 degrees for oak, but it's like, yeah, if you had that like fully burning where it was like the flames were licking yeah. the bottom, it would just catch it on fire. Yeah. Unless and oftentimes you're... it's, it's like hyper like technological now where they actually have like temperature readers and it tells the guy whether to add more wood or not. And it, it ranges. Have, I'd rather have some old dude who just does his been doing right? It's that's the like, traditional thing. But yeah, it yeah. tends to range between like 180 and 300. So it's much below like where you'd actually be like then burning the stuff above it, like the heat hitting so it's like the wood. half of the, uh, yeah. the ignition point. Yeah, yeah, so you have it at a place where it's getting some of the heat and some of the smoke, but not burning itself. So that's how you get caramelization flavors in the, in, the, in the wine. You're actually literally caramelizing the oak sugars, and the way you get smokiness is from that fire smoking it. But also, if you if you toast, if you make that fire a little hotter, the oak wood actually becomes like a little like towards burnt. 
my you get Maillard reactions. It's like grill marks you get on on meat. It's like um, a little char on the bottom of your skillet. You know that is all Maillard reactions. It's like just before burnt you get these. Like it's also how coffee gets a roasted flavor. Um, chocolate you go through the same processes, and so that's why if you get wine like chocolate, coffee, caramel flavors, you're getting that because they are literally going through the same chemical process of heat causing these flavors, which is also another really great way to think about how you pair foods. If a wine has one of those flavors, think about some of, something else that has those flavors. Yeah, and it also, touching on what you're saying, because it's not really, they're not like uh, cooking over the fire, they are smoking over that fire, because you'd smoke something at like 220, 250, you know, yeah. right around in the range where they're doing that. So anything smoked, you know, and again, kind of like crossing the barriers because fish should normally be on the light end, but like smoked salmon or something would mm -hmm. probably be really good or anything yeah, smoked over like true. hickory wood or oak or, or maple, you know, the woods present in this, yeah. it's going to bring out those caramely notes that like smokiness in them to like pair that together in yeah. the same way that fire grilling it would. So. Yeah, I agree. So, so that another little trick of food pairing and, well, on that note, I think we've uh, we've kind of covered everything pretty well and, and gone over our pairings. And I'm going to finish with a final literary pairing. This is from Hippocrates. And the quote is, let, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So, you know, eat well to stay healthy. You are what you eat. Hope you guys enjoyed the wine. And, you know, we try to make this wine as healthy as possible. So hopefully you're feeling nice and good right now and healthy. Enjoy some good food. Enjoy some good wine. Share it with folks you know and love. Um, if you're, you know, sheltering at home together, or share it virtually. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed everything. We'll see you guys again next time. Cheers.